I'm just so thrilled to welcome all of you to our baking demo with the one and only Erin Goyawaga. Uh, we're so lucky to have Erin here teaching us um, how to do gluten-free baking. She'll be sharing all her tips and tricks with us. And we have a wonderful host who's gonna take us through the whole event today. Her name is Abina Anam Samwa, and some of you might remember Abina from our Friendsgiving event last month. So let's also welcome Abina to the screen. I would like to thank our sponsor for today's demo. It's Amazon Home. Um, Amazon Home has so many wonderful products, some of which you will see in Erin's kitchen. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Erin and her cookbook. Erin um, has a beautiful cookbook came out last year called Canel Avenue. Uh, it's the name of Erin's blog. A lot of you know her from her wonderful blog. Um, but again, we're just so thrilled to have both of them with us today. Erin, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yay, hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I can't see you. Uh, oh, <laughs> you yeah. can't hear me, but you can see me. Well, I can see you and I can see your beautiful space um, in Seattle, which I've had the privilege of visiting. And I just wanted to thank you for doing this today. What a treat. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm excited to uh, get to meet Abina. Absolutely. And you are making your spice, I want to get, get the title correct, your spice chocolate cranberry yeast bread. Yes. And it is both vegan and gluten-free. The recipe is on cherrybomb.com. I know a lot of you are going to be baking along with Erin. Um, and you can also find some of the tools that Erin is using from Amazon Home on our site as well. So let's see if, did we lose Abina or is Abina out there? <gasps> Yay, there you I'm are. Right hey, how's it going everyone? Nice to see you, Abina. How are you? I'm so great. Thanks for asking. I'm super excited for this. This is going to be a treat. So I'm Abina is, uh, I don't want to use the, the word amateur, but you are an amateur. I want to make it clear. You're not a professional baker. So Abina really is going to be in the mindset of all of us today. And she's going to be asking questions of her own. She's going to be monitoring the Q&A box and the chat. Well, I'm going to let you two take over. Have a wonderful time and let's get baking. Let's dig in. Let's. I just want to get going so we can yeah. get bread fermenting. And um, so, so everybody has or should have the recipe and the ingredients. So I have oat milk here that I'm going to just warm up to about 105 degrees. It's, I don't even put a thermometer in there. It's just like when it feels like a little bit warmer than body temperature, that's when it's ready. If you right. heat, uh, I'm using active, active dry yeast. Um, and so active dry yeast, uh, the reason why you heat the liquid is because it has, the particles of yeast have an outer shell that need to be disintegrated to activate the live yeast that's inside. Um, if you're using instant yeast, for example, you don't need to heat your uh, milk, but it, you can actually use almost equal amounts of, the, they're pretty much equivalent. Uh, active dry yeast and instant yeast. And I know in some countries like in Europe, it's easier to find instant yeast than active dry yeast. So you would just mix the dry, the dry yeast with the dry ingredients and then the liquid separately. Yeah, that's super awesome. So I just like, obviously we can talk through the ingredients. I, at full disclosure, I've made one gluten-free vegan recipe. I typically don't um, big gluten-free things because I'm not gluten-free, but I've made stuff for friends. Um, so you use, is it psyllium husk powder? What is that? And why is that such an important component in, in what we're, what you're doing? So what happens in, especially, I mean, gluten-free baking has sort of two, all baking, right? But the way gluten-free baking becomes a challenge is when you incorporate fermentation. So the, through the process of activate, you know, fermenting yeast, whether it's wild yeast or uh, baker's yeast or commercial yeast, you're creating, uh, the, your leavening comes from fermentation, from gases that expand the, the layers of flour that you have, right? So when you're using uh, flour that has gluten, when gluten is mixed with water and it's stretched, it becomes very elastic. So if you imagine like a, like a parachute or like a hot air balloon or something that when there's air that pushes it up, it can expand, but because in gluten-free baking, you don't have those strands um, of, you don't have that elasticity, you have to add something to create it. So until probably 10 years ago or so, um, Santangan was the ingredient that was most used uh, 
uh, to create that elasticity. But it's sort of a hard thing to digest for a lot of people. So then um, psyllium and flaxseed have been introduced in bread baking, gluten-free bread baking as a substitute for sandlin gum. And psyllium husk is, uh, it's a plant fiber. And so when you mix it with water or any other liquid, it expands and gels. And so that gives it a little bit of elasticity to the dough, if that yeah. makes sense. No, that, that makes total perfect sense. Is it something though that you should sort of, cause I feel like baking sometimes is about substitutions. Is that one of those things that it's a non-negotiable if you're ever making uh, a yeasted dough? Like could I use something else instead of the psyllium husk? You could use this santan gum or other, uh, other like guar gum or other uh, things, but psyllium is the one that absorbs most liquid. So I think it's really good for bread baking. Um, and for pastry, for example, santham works a little bit better. Like if you're trying to make a puff pastry or something uh, or pasta, something that needs to be stretched that doesn't have a ton of liquid. Uh, and actually while we were talking, I heated the <laughs> milk way too much. Oh so no. now my finger and then <laughs> it kind of burns. Um, and so I would not want to use it right now because it would kill my yeast, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So what um, I might do, I may do a little trick. Oh, I love I love baking tricks. These, these are awesome. Kind of low on time. Also, speaking of uh, tools or uh, tools you can find on Amazon and um, that I think it's indispensable in bread baking and all baking, but especially bread baking is a digital scale. Yeah, I actually have mine here as well. So everybody, is, it's like the first thing I try to enjoy <laughs> in the kitchen. Um, yeah, so someone just asked, if you are using the xanthan gum, I don't want to get too too deep in the technical weeds here, but is it a one-to-one -one ratio for the xanthan gum to psyllium husk so powder? It's kind of like a trial and error. If you're trying to substitute one for the other, uh, definitely psyllium husk uh, absorbs a lot more liquid. So if you're going to, let's say you're using a recipe that uses xanthan gum, yeah. and then you're going you're gonna to do, you're going to convert to psyllium, you have to not only account for that conversion of those ingredients, but also that you will need a lot more liquid in it. So about one teaspoon of sandan gum, you need the equivalent power, like elasticity power would be about two to three tablespoons of psyllium husk powder. And that's it. And like psyllium husk is like one ingredient that it's kind of tricky and because there's inconsistency among brands too. Sometimes like it's probably the number one problem I've been helping people troubleshoot when they have problems with bread is that I always tell them, okay, tell me what psyllium you're using because psyllium husk, whole psyllium husks and psyllium husk powder are two different. I mean, they come from the same plant, but the, the way they react in a recipe is very different. So all my recipes are written to use psyllium husk powder. And you want the powder to be super finely milled. And I'll show you in a second. Um, John, can you get the camera? It's like, it's almost like flour. Whoa, OK. If you're using uh, husks, it'll be more like a flake. And I'm not finding this at like my regular grocery store. Is, it, is this something that's common at the health food store or? The health food store, it's actually, it's the stuff that you find in uh, laxatives. Oh. So it is a laxative, so if you have uh, like IBS or like if you have trouble with a lot of fiber in your diet, it might be something that could upset you. Mm. Uh, so it is something that, you know, you might want to test out first, but it is, um, you can find it in whole food stores, but there's also like brands that are not as potent because maybe they're used more as a laxative. Uh, but so you want to get something that's uh, baking grade. Um, and can I share brands? I mean, it's useful, right? Yeah. I Probably for this one. Uh, there's two brands that I use mostly. Uh, I don't have the packages here, but one is Anthony's Goods and one is Viva. And I am not sponsored. Any brand that I mentioned uh, here, I'm not sponsored by anybody. So I'm really like giving uh, honest opinion about product. Yeah. So um, this is still like. I want your milk to burn again. So. <laughs> no, no. Was, I knew it was going to happen. Uh, so this is too, too hot. So I'm going to kind of cool it down. Nice. So then I'll have to read, this was measured, but I'll uh, measure again. Yeah, awesome. So I wanted to ask sort of generally about why gluten-free baking? You've, you've had your, your blog, Canal and Vanille for, for quite some time now, and it seems that that's prim the primary focus. Um, what sort of, I feel like most people, you know, you start your baking blog for a reason. 
Um, why did you focus on gluten-free baking specifically? So I used to be a pastry chef um, and I was not gluten-free. And then 12 years ago, I think, I can't remember how long, 10 years ago, um, I started getting sick. I had, I developed autoimmune disease after I, autoimmune disease after I had children. And so I was super sick. I was having um, vertigo and uh, anemia and just like depression and a bunch of other things. And um, then I discovered that I had through, you know, naturopaths and kind of sort of like underground, like doing weird testing and stuff. I, I discovered that I had gluten um, intolerance amongst other things. And so as soon as I heard that, I was like, okay, great. Cause now I have something that's going to make me feel better, or at least I can explore this thing. And because I had a background in baking already, I, I sort of understood a lot of, and I had dabbled in some gluten-free baking, uh, mostly cakes and things that are really easy to convert. Um, and then that's the turn it took. Yeah, but I, I, I've only, I've been gluten-free maybe 10, 11 years. Yeah. So let's, get, let's, let's get this mixed. Yes. So let's 525 grams of uh, milk and you can use whole milk you can use i had people ask me you can use hemp milk uh, nut milk the only thing is make sure it's not sweetened uh, or has like that it's too gummy or anything like that so i'm going to measure the yeast is in here Ooh, i went a little bit oh, no. no problem i'm going to fish out some milk without trying to get too much yeast. That's always the-, the I'm the, nervous. <laughs> you got this, I, I fully believe in you. Okay, we have a few more substitution questions. And yeah, it, it's such an interesting trend. I, I recently was talking to Bonnie Holiday, who's at Buddhist Bake Shop, and she had a very similar um, experience where she also developed a gluten intolerance after many years in the in the pastry world. What's, what's going on? <laughs> um, yeah maybe overexposure to some things, you know? Yeah, no. Also, before, uh, before we move with the question, I'm gonna add molasses to this. Oh, yes. And then this is gonna ferment for 10 minutes until it kind of puffs up. Um, and it will actually even look a little curdled because there's acidity in the molasses that will kind of curdle the milk and that's okay. And that's the primary sweetening agent. No, nothing, nothing else is sweet that's going in there. That's just molasses and then the cranberries that could be a little sweet, you know? Um, that's natural sugars though. Um, yeah, that's so, that's so cool. Um, is there, could you substitute the molasses for anything else or is that one thing that you just need in there for also, not just for like its texture, but also for taste? Well, it's also for taste, but um, you could use honey. You could even use brown sugar. You could use another maple syrup. Uh, they're not like maple syrup, honey, and molasses are not the same sweetening power, but it's okay. It would work. The recipe would come out the same. Yeah. I just like, I love buckwheat and molasses together because they're both, both very earthy and dark and sort of a little bitter. Um, Good combo and pancakes too. I, I realize that it's hard to find in some places. So this is, we're going to let this kind of hang out for about 10 minutes. That's a, that's a really good question. So someone just asked about um, buckwheat flour. So um, they, I think, live in Mexico, and they said, can you sub substitute um, the buckwheat flour for any other flour? Because they don't yes, have- Yeah, I wanted to talk about buckwheat flour. And I have some examples here. So these are, so their buckwheat is actually um, not a grain. So it's, come, it's like a pseudo grass, right? So it's really suitable for people who are trying to do a grain-free diet or people that have trouble with insulin resistance because um, it's not a grain, it's easier to digest. Um, and you can get the buckwheat groats. So there's like, it's not kasha. Kasha is like toasted buckwheat groats, but you can get the raw buckwheat groats and they're very soft. So you can grind them at home if you have a hard time finding flour. And that flour that you grind from uh, the groats is actually really uh, light in color. So I actually have two, I saw this, there's, can you, can, can you see? There's two buckwheat flowers mixed in here. Yeah. Cause That's I use them in cool the yeah. And so this one on the bottom is actually uh, raw buckwheat groats that I ground. 
And the one on the top is actually, uh, I think it's Bob's Red Mill. So I actually contacted Bob's Red Mill, ask, asking them, why is their buckwheat flour darker? Because I was just was like, why? And they told me it's not toasted. It's just that they add extra hull into their flour mix. Um, and so I actually prefer the lighter version just because it, the dark version, like in this one, then this recipe wouldn't really matter because we're gonna add cocoa powder and it's gonna be kind of dark anyway from the molasses and everything. But if you're making, let's say a cake um, and you want it to remain kind of yellow or uh, sort of what we associate with like a cake, um, the light buck buckwheat flour won't really change the color much, but the darker one will. And for, to answer the question about where to get it in Mexico, I'm not sure. You know, buckwheat is one of those things that may be more a European. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, could. I, think, I think they were asking more for a substitute. So if they didn't have buckwheat, could they use like a chickpea, oat, rice, you know? Uh, you can do, uh, actually, you know, you can use oat flour in its place. Um, they're both oat, oat flour and buckwheat flour when mixed with water are actually kind of uh, slimy a little bit. So they have this, you know, when you make oatmeal, how it's just kind of like slimy, they both have that property. Um, so they're both very sort of gummy and they stick the dough together and they help with that expansion with the, like that elasticity that you need to create. So I would say they're different in flavor, but oats are sweet, you know, that milky flavor and, and buckwheat is like earthy, bitter. So Flavor-wise, they're very different, but property-wise, could be interchangeable. Yeah, I guess I you could. Substitute things a lot, like sorghum flour, which is also hard to find in some places. It's uh, you can substitute it with millet flour. So it just really depends. But I, in general, like a whole grain flour, it, that gluten-free whole grain flour, whether it's brown rice flour, oat flour, buckwheat, you can kind of in, in a pinch you could substitute one. Yeah. For the but then you need a component of starch. So, you know, like when you, also when you make, uh, when you have all purpose flour in, um, in wheat, you also have not just whole grain, but you also have a starch component, right? So in gluten-free baking, we add a little bit more starch, whether it's tapioca or potato or cornstarch. Yeah. Just the three starches. Okay, so circling back to the recipe, what should our, if it's sitting now, it's probably been sitting for the five minutes as, as it says. Yeah, we're gonna need, John, can you come closer? Yeah. We're gonna need a little bit more Look time. For, okay. Like, see, it's like bubbling up. Oh, some bubbles on the top, okay. Bubbles on the top, it's gonna be a little bit more than that. Yeah, okay. Like, it's gonna be like a little puffy. Um, and so while that sits, and that, when that ferments really well, we're gonna add the psyllium and the flaxseed to it. We're gonna whisk it and that's gonna become, we're gonna let it sit for like five minutes and it's gonna become a gel. Nice. And that's, that's so, what gives our, our structure. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to translate it into non-glutenese. Like what, what, what purpose is that necessary? Is that sort of setting up that gluten formation so you can get the Elasticity. Get, like power to knead it as you're baking? Well, you don't really even need to knead it because you're not really, when you knead bread made with wheat, you're trying to create more elasticity, right? And when you mix gluten with water and actually you mix it when you knead it, it keeps stretching, right? Like when you're making pasta too, like as you're, you're stretching it and you're rolling it, it keeps stretching even more. That doesn't really happen in gluten-free baking. So that's actually an advantage and a lot easier. I find that when you make this recipe, it's like super simple. Yeah. Uh, you, you will never get the same holds and the same expansion as you do with gluten baking. But uh, in some ways it's fast, it's quicker too, because you don't need to fuss with things as long. Yeah. Um, so in the meantime, let's mix our dry ingredients. This recipe can be made by hand, super easy. Um, I like to use a stand mixer with a dough hook because it has a little bit more force and makes the doughs a little bit smoother and they, uh, the flour kind of breaks down easier. But I get asked that a lot, like, do I really need a stand mixer to make this? And it's no, you can just mix it with a wooden spoon and then you kind of want to get in with your hands and just, the, the purpose of mixing is not so much developing anything. It's just more hydrating the flour. Mm. 
but you there you can is there a way you could over mix it because i know that's a big concern when you're, whenever you're making bread um like not like really. traditional bread. i mean maybe i just never have done it but you could in theory you shouldn't have any problem because there's not that you know i mean i guess you could break some strands but i don't think so yeah I feel like with food, um, you actually can like break the strands cool so it looks like you have uh, buckwheat flour, tapioca starch, mm -hmm. and some uh, cocoa powder. Is that what's yep. going into the, the dry ingredients? Yep, so I have 240 grams of buckwheat flour, and I have the light kind, but you could use, again, like I said, the darker kind. Um, 120 grams of tapioca starch. I've made this bread like five times this week, so I'm just like, I know it's not my heart. Muscle memory. Um, <laughs> Question about the tapioca starch. If I don't have tapioca starch, what can I use? You know, you I know it's something that's super common, but you can use um, cornstarch or you can use arrowroot. Cornstarch oh. is probably the easiest. They're a little bit different. Like when if you make a pudding with cornstarch or a tapioca starch, tapioca starch is way more slimy. Like cornstarch has more of a I don't know how to explain it um like a short like a does that make sense if i say that like it doesn't get as strandy hmm. like when you make if you make a pastry cream with tapioca starch your your whisk will be like pulling like glue or something with the same amount so cornstarch is a little bit not as slimy but it w would work in this bread okay. um and then i'm gonna add cocoa powder Nice. And that, like, are you using a Dutch processed cocoa or what, what's the cocoa that- It's just raw cacao powder. Oh, nice. Um, and it doesn't really matter as much because we don't have like baking soda or something that would affect uh, the texture. Not the texture, but the chemical reaction, sorry. Yeah. Um, and then cinnamon and ginger. Yes. Obviously, and canal, very important. <laughs> And uh, essentially all the rest of the ingredients are gonna go in here. Cranberries, and my, mine are unsweetened. Then I have uh, chocolate with 70% and uh, it's just chopped up, but you could use chocolate chips or you can even use chocolate that's a little bit sweeter if you want. Um, and then just the, it says one teaspoon of orange zest, but I'm just doing one. So yeah, it looks like a teaspoon of each for the ground cinnamon and the ground sugar. Uh, sorry, ground ginger. Um, but would love to sort of hear when you started gluten free baking. Where, what were some of your inspirations? Like, who are people that you were looking to? Um, um, as oh, yeah, so many. I um, I remember the first time I ever heard about using psyllium uh, in bread baking was through Dan Leopard, who is actually a British uh, food writer. He writes for The Guardian. And I don't think he's gluten free, but he must have been writing a, a story about it. Um, and then in Seattle, we have um, Shauna Earn, who is Gluten Free Girl. And she's, I don't know if she's still publishing recipes, but she was also making bread. And Naomi Devlin in the UK, um, she is a teacher at River Cottage. And she um, has a gluten free uh, book that includes baking. And she does a lot of sourdough stuff too um, on Instagram and on her blog. Um, I don't want to leave anybody behind, but I feel like those are like, Dan was the first, Dan Leopard was the first person I ever, you know, that was like a discovery. And this is long, like a while ago, 10 years ago um, or so. And then Naomi is a great friend. Uh, yeah. So yeah. That's those so awesome. For sure. Um, okay, I'm going to just kind of toss these around. Nice. Just to combine. Just to combine. And then, John, can you get closer? Yeah. The I don't know if you can appreciate it, but the yeast is already like puffy. Can you see oh, how? Oh, nice. Yeah, you can see it's that. Kind of like yeah. thicky, yeah. thick, thicky. Well, I'm making that work. It's sort of like a. It's a little curdled. That's from the molasses. Mmm, uh, that looks like, beautiful. Whisking the psyllium and the flaxseed. John, can you show the the yeah. flax is also. It's not as fine. It does have a little bit more like a coarse feel to it than the psyllium, but it's also as fine as possible. So I'm gonna add all, 
all of it in. And you want to whisk right away because it starts gelling. Mm. Let it sit, it will kind of clump up and then it's very hard to break. That's so interesting. So what were some of the biggest challenges as you were discovering gluten-free baking? Like what were things where just like you missed so much that you couldn't necessarily cross over um, into the- It was definitely one. Um, my first book came out in 2012 and so I started working on it in uh, 2010. So that's 10 years ago. And the, if you look at the bread recipes, I, there's only like two bread recipes in it, but they're definitely <laughs> not very, uh, I wouldn't, they're not like the final results are not as good. Like I've learned so much and definitely bread has been the biggest, uh, yeah, it's just the hardest thing to kind of conquer. Yeah, I think that's just universal, regardless of-, of Yeah, the, exactly. Um, and so you said, like, what are some, like, um, so for flaxseed, is it Bob's, Bob's Red Mill? I feel like everyone can find. Are there other preferred brands that you like for flaxseed? I'm going to kind of talk about flowers in general. I love um, Authentic Foods. It's a small, very small company, and they're actually, they mail their own flowers, uh, and they're in California, and they're their all their flowers are triple milled and they're super fine it's it's hard to find you have to order it online and it's expensive but there's family uh owned company and so they're really amazing um they don't do any publicity or any marketing so i feel like you don't really hear about them a lot but yeah. the products are really 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 good um and then anthony's goods i think they're more like a i might be saying this wrong but i think they're more like a pre a packager so they they buy all these flowers from different sources and then they package them. But they have a really good quality, um, like their, their flaxseed is also my favorite. Their psyllium flaxseed, their cow powder, um, the buckwheat flour. Um, they also have a fine farm rice flour that's good. Um, so there's like a few like that. And then I'd like Bob's. Bob's is really uh, available, even in Canada, right? Like you can find Bob's and some of their products are great. Their brown rice flour is not my favorite, I have to say. It's stone ground, so it's very coarse, sort of gritty. It doesn't absorb um, water very well. So uh, you need to use less water if you're using that brown rice flour. Yeah. Uh, like 10% less maybe. Um, but yeah, what other, Arrowhead Mills is okay. I have to say, not my favorite, but they are also available, readily av available. Yeah, um, it's very, it sounds very much like trial and error. Like I feel like in Canada, we don't have a lot of stuff in the States, but yeah. um, there's one flower company, Robin Hood, I think that started, you know, shifting into the, um, like the gluten-free space as well, because it's become such a popular um, like choice. And I think baking is one of the first things that everyone wants to sort of try out when it comes to testing out gluten-free stuff. Yeah. Um, Oh, I'm going to show you quickly before. Yes, before it turns into rock. <laughs> oh, that looks so cool. So now it's like gel, right? Yeah. So I'm going to just add the whole thing in here. Nice. It looks, I know it looks kind of weird. It's going to taste delicious. You know, it's very mm -hmm. ugly delicious. <laughs> I wish yeah. you could smell it because, you know, the molasses just smells so good. And then the. Can you describe it to us? What does it smell like from behind the camera? It smells like ginger cookies. You know, oh. like this ginger cookies? It smells like that. That sounds delicious. Just in time for the holidays. So again, um, like this, you could just toss it with a spoon or, and then kind of get your hands in there. I'm going to mix it with a stand mixer. So it's going to be a little loud. Hang in there. It's totally fine. And this stand mixer, I always have a hard time. The bowl attached. It's a great color. Yeah, it's again, I'm not sponsored by KitchenAid, but their stand mixers are the best. Dual of stand mixers. I think I don't think you need to. <laughs> okay, I just we just got a question for the um the bread pan, getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Oh, yeah, no, that's great. I actually should have prepared the bread pan. So I'm gonna show you two. Oh, nice. Okay, so these are, I think this is Chicago metal, and this is USA pan. 
So they're both of them one low one pound loaf pans. Um, you can see it, okay, right? Yeah. But one is longer and more narrow and taller than the other one. So if you put them side by side too, wow. you can see. And so either one of those would work for this recipe, but because I like bread to look tall. And I know a lot of people ask me, why is your bread so tall and mine doesn't get as tall? And it's really a visual trick. So like the pans that I use are narrow. So the bread appears taller, but it's the same amount and it's the same weight. And if I cut into it, we likely have the same crumb openness. It's just that it's visually probably looks taller because I use this pan. So like if I put this, actually they're the same width, but one is the height, but they both hold one pound. So it's like the the tall pan is from Chicago, and these can, are, can you find both of these on Amazon? Yeah, yeah, you can get these at Amazon. The one this Chicago. Yep. And then this one. See, I'm sh I'm showing I'm showing it to the wrong camera. And this is a uh, U.S. pan. Okay. Cool. US, USA pan. USA. USA. And that's another one. A Pullman loaf is like really good for uh, Great family. They, they tend to be taller. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's that's awesome. That's I'm really gonna turn the speed a little bit higher so it'll be a little louder. I guess one thing I, I love asking about tools and stuff because I feel like tools are so nifty in the kitchen. What were three or four tools that you found super impactful when you when you started oh. free baking? Or you think every gluten-free baker should have? Definitely a digital scale. And then I'm gonna get, for, and this is for bread baking. Um, you need a bench scraper. And I actually have two kinds. So I have a ben bench scraper that I use to cut dough, clean my surfaces, move things around. Uh, and then I have a plastic one. It's kind of like a thick plastic. And this is the stuff I use when the doughs are like, with like this one that's very sticky. Um, it's great to get in there. It's very much like professional baker thing. Like when you make like a huge Hobart meringue and you're just like a little spatula that won't do. So you're just getting yeah. big with it. Um, so I use this all the time. Uh, and this one is actually yeah, just a teco, like the people that make the, the spatulas. The, yeah. Yeah, the tips and stuff. Um, this is almost. <laughs> That KitchenAid, it's getting its work cut out for it today. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Oh, that look at that color. That looks amazing. It's very, wow. it's almost like a, like a thick cake batter or it's bouncier than cake batter for sure. Yeah. I guess you can't really do the test with the like, you know, indenting your, your finger. Yeah, it's like, let me get it on the surface. Nice floured surface too. <laughs> And are you using, uh, would you just use whatever flour you're using in the, in the mix to, to the flour the surface? Exactly. Um, and also if you have a, like a marble, this is a quartz countertop, you don't really need to use a ton of flour because your surface is already kind of nonstick. Mm -hmm. So this, I know I, I said I added a little bit too much liquid, but I think it needed it. Like it doesn't feel too wet to me. Yeah. I took some of the milk off because I felt like I, I did too. I, I will say that the flour, putting the flour on the surface was very, very impressed with the wrist technique there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's, I grew up in a, so my family, my grandparents and everyone in my family um, worked in a bakery. Oh, so that's a family trade. And so I, I just remember my uncle when he used to make puff pastry by hand, just like taking, like he had a big, long stainless steel surface and he just would like, like just dust the whole thing. And I just have that memory of childhood. So this is like, it's sticky, but it's uh, holding its shape. Yeah. And you know, if you could use, for example, this recipe and roll it out a little bit and sprinkle cinnamon and then sort of do like, a roll. It won't be like a cinnamon. You know what I mean? Like a, like a, a log. Like yeah. A log. And then so you have like layers, a little bit of layered 
cinnamon effect in it. And is your pan ungreased or on like there's nothing in the pan there's or nothing there yet? And I'm gonna actually bury my little cranberries in there a little bit more. Nice. They don't get burned as much when they're exposed to heat. And this is gonna expand as it ferments. So um, I'm gonna just dust the inside of this with buckwheat flour. And it's not necessary. You don't really need to prepare the pan with anything, but I like the look of flour on bread. You know, like it just gives it some- it's, it's not a grease thing, but it's a, um, it's more a stylistic choice here. Yeah, you know, you want to have some dust on there. Yeah, you gotta have some spice. <laughs> so that goes in, and we're gonna cover it with a kitchen towel. I'm gonna wash my hands. That's super important. <laughs> um, so we have some some technical questions on the bread. So I know sometimes what happens is even with like I think pie dough is another thing that happens. If your dough is I guess I can ask you a series of questions. Like if your dough is too wet, what should you do to sort of get it back to speed? With pie dough? Sorry, no, with, with the bread specifically. Oh, it's too wet. Um, then just add a little bit more flour. Okay. And uh, you go ahead. It's better. So I always recommend if you're unsure, like let's say you're testing a recipe. Obviously, if you're following a recipe, you want to follow the recipe as it's written. But let's say you're experimenting. It's better with gluten-free baking, it's better to add less liquid and then kind of get your dough mixing and then add more because you're not really going to overmix. Uh, and you, it's better to just like build up the, the moisture, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, but yes, if you've added too much by accident, then just add a little bit more flour. But it's easier to add more than take out for sure. What if, if it's too dry, which, what should be the best alternative there? Just add more water or milk. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Great. So it's meant for about, depends on your kitchen, but I say in the recipe 45 minutes, but if your kitchen is warm, like we're in my studio and it's actually not very warm. So I would say it probably will need 45 minutes. Um, but at my house this morning, when I made the swap out, it was done in 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. so, that's an important thing with gluten-free baking is um, overproofing. And I don't know if people have asked about this, but it's a, it's a big deal because when you uh, proof, so like with gluten, right? You, your gases expand, but you have an el like a elastic protein that will kind of give you that expansion and will hold it. And some of the, like those uh, strands can tear, you know, if you overproofed you, that happens in gluten gluten baking too, but in gluten free baking, it's like you go too far and it's like, it's hard to come back. And so what happens is your crumb, so there's fermentation, fermentation, heat, gases, alcohol, CO2, all that stuff expands. And then your little delicate strands of flour and psyllium and flax kind of like break. Mm. So then gas, gases leave the dough and then everything falls. Um, but if you're making bread, sometimes like your exterior crust has already solidified and baked in place. So then what will happen is your crumb will sort of like psh, collapse into itself and then there will be an air pocket on top. And that's like the most common question that I get about gluten-free baking. <laughs> bread baking. It's the only way. <laughs> um, <laughs> obviously I feel like most people have loaf pans, but let's say, you know, I wake up one day and I want to make this, but oh no, my loaf pan is gone. Like, could I make this in a, um yeah. and something else like a cast iron like or anything like that good question you could make it um you could make it free form you could make it like proof it in a proofing basket but likely if you don't have a loaf pan you don't have a proofing basket you can proof it in a bowl like in a kind of a narrow bowl like maybe seven or eight inches and then uh when it's proofed delicately turn it over onto a baking sheet and just it, what will happen in that case, um, most likely is that it won't rise. It won't be like gluten bread that it just like, oh, it goes up like that. It has a tendency more to, to rise this way, expand this way. That's why you kind of need, especially with this recipe, you kind of need some walls, but, um, but it could, I mean, still be delicious. Yeah. Well, if you, if anyone tries these out, like I feel like this is a, a fun science experiment you can, you can try. Yeah. Um, 
Awesome. So I guess we're just waiting for it to prove unless there's the magic of television and we have- we're, We have to swap out, um, but I do want to show this, what it looks like when it's proved. So you kind of will see that with Baker so the I'm not doing sourdough here, but it's really easy to tell when the fermentation is done or when you should put it in the oven with baker's yeast because it's very controlled. Uh, and it's when it's almost doubled, like regular baking, right? You see it, it's like poop, like pops up and it's almost double and you bake it and it's fine. With sourdough is different because it doesn't really rise with the same, um, it doesn't have the same power. Baker's yeast or commercial yeast is really fabricated and, um, I don't want to say harvests. Yeah, it's fabricated to be very consistent and to very, and all the properties are like controlled, right? So it's, you know what to expect. With sourdough is different. And so it doesn't have the same expansion and it just takes longer and all of that. So with this, we'll see, it'll be very clear. Yeah. Uh, um, so what would like underproved dough look like then? Because you mentioned if it's overproof, you're going to see that air pocket. Then what, like on the flip side of that, what would that look like? once it's baked then your crumb will be very tight mm. so it will have really holes yeah I mean, but then but tight holes can also be that it's uh overproofed because then it kind of collapsed onto itself so it's very hard like troubleshooting i have to know all, when people ask me this and they send me photos and i love it but it, and i've actually learned so much by helping people troubleshoot because it forces me to think about different things and um, then I have to know everything. Like, did you actually use, use a scale? What is your room temperature? Where did you, did you prove it at 75 degrees or did you prove it in the oven at 95 degrees? So all those things are like, I need to know. Uh, yeah, there are so many questions in here about proving and underproving. So okay. yeah, it's true. Around is, we'll, we'll take all your DMs, <laughs> try them out. I, I may have given you a little bit too much homework there. Um, and so it looks, so typically most doughs also go through a two rise process. Like I know I made challah bread over the weekend and it's a two rise process, but this one's only really calling for one. Is there a reason? Um, you can do a two rise. So with two rise, you're actually really trying to develop the flavor too. This is more like, oh. and also when you're using baker's yeast, there, it's really flavor like it's like the profile of the yeast and the bacteria that's in there is really like like the flavor they think about the flavor also um and so it's sweet naturally you know what i mean like it already is a potent flavor of yeast um so i just wanted to have a recipe that's like really simple to do but it, i could like what you call bulk ferment this so I could ferment it in a bowl, punch it down, shape it again, and do it again. You could. You could also do this in the fridge. So let's say I mix this, uh, This let's say it's like 10 o'clock at night and I put it in the low fan and I put it in the fridge and I bake it. You don't want to leave it in for hours and hours, but you could retard, it's called retard fermentation, lay mm. in the fermentation in cold temperature. And let's say you wake up at six in the morning and then you bake it uh, and then you have fresh bread in the morning. Um, so you could do that. Um, other, like I have in my new book, I have recipes that are more for like rich doughs, like hala, um, brioche, like babka, and, and all of those do have two step fermentation. Yeah. So yeah. I know we're down to our last. Of, like some things that are really simple than sourdough that takes so long, like, you know, like sometimes you might need bread right away. Yeah. I'm excited to try your gluten-free because I I always think like some things are just you cannot replace. Um, so yeah, I think I'm definitely excited to try the the I love brioche bread. I, I always have a loaf of it in in the fridge or in the kitchen. Well, it's not quite the same. It doesn't have the same pool. Like you don't get those like fluffy like little strands. And the thing with gluten-free yeast breads is that they dry out a lot quicker. Um, and so that's, you know, that's another thing. Like bread is usually good for one to two days. And then, yeah. um, I mean, all breads, right? But I, I do feel like gluten-free breads tend to dry out a bit faster. Yeah. So should I be storing, like if, if I made a gluten-free loaf, what's the best place to store? Like on the counter in the bread box or should I just put it in the fridge and then take like, or freezer cut out as I need it? You can do freezer cut out and then wrap tightly. Um, we all, I mean, because we're a family of four, we eat a lot of bread. It's just a, 
on the counter wrapped in parchment or wax, you know, like those wax, um, they're not paper, but yeah. What are those called? Like sheets that you, of wax. Oh, parchment. Huh? Is it parchment paper? Yeah, parchment, you could use parchment, mm -hmm. but there's like this wax um, fabric that I, I don't remember Stuff the name. you put on the metal trays? No, no, that's parchment. It's, um, and I don't have any here. I said beeswax. Or you could use like a wax canvas bag or they sell bread specific, but I don't, you know, I think parchment is fine. Beeswax wrap is, is what Yes, yes, beeswax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are, those are super great to have. Yeah. Um, and all the recipes are in your, your only book, Canal and Vanille, which is where, right? Is there, is there another book? This recipe is not in that book, so it's it's new. So it's for everybody to make. I mean, but I think people are asking about the other enrichment. Oh yeah, so um, I have I have two books. My first one came out in 2012, which was a long time ago. And uh, I feel like, I love it, but it feels like a different time. And then my last one, uh, Canela Vini, um, it's from last year, that came out last year. And the new one, it's a baking book that will be out next fall. And it's all gluten-free, um, dairy-free recipes, lots of um, vegan options. Sort of like trying to balance, or like I was trying to find recipes that were being respectful of traditional pastry and baking, but also explore like the alternative baking world and, and things that were a little bit more nourishing. Although, you know, it's hard to say what's nourishing and baking. Yeah. I'm so excited for the next book. I, I mean, I, I feel like, if, if there's one person who's going to make me a gluten-free expert, it's, it's bound to be you. All right, well, let's look at the bread real quick, see if it's done anything. Not yet. Whoa. We need to let it go a little bit more. It'll, this oh, bread it looks like going. We've got the green light from Carrie, so. Okay, okay. So yeah. this will come to about the top. Yeah, I wouldn't let it go past the, the top of this pan. Okay, cool. I, I, have one, I have one pro tip that I've heard is if you ever need like a good like neutral places if you put it in your oven with the kitchen light turned on the oven light turned on that's a pretty good um but, that is oh. true but in gluten free baking that can be too aggressive and it's oh. too fast and then then it's overproofing happens really quickly and that's why I, I i actually write that in my book for um the sourdough but i find that unless you're like on it it tends to overproof uh, bread and a lot of people have that problem and I'm sorry I wrote it I wrote that option in my book but I I don't really recommend it all the time unless you know like okay I've done this before I keep it in there for 15 minutes or an hour whatever it is yeah um, well today I learned you know you can't, <laughs> you can't have it all you can't you can't just transfer things over um but you you <laughs> talked a little bit about um yeah let's see let's see what it looks like that magic of television that all happens so quickly. I wanted to um, show you. So when you take the bread out of the oven, it will feel like you, it will be hollow, right? But then because this has milk, milk tenderizes breads. So right. if, you have, if, you, if you were to make this with water, which you totally could, uh, it would become a very crusty loaf. Mm -hmm. And then when it has milk, it's tenderized. So it has a very thin... It's almost like a thin, like a soft sandwich bread. Oh, that looks incredible. And how long did that go in the oven for? So it's 30 minutes at 425 degrees in the pan. In the pan. Okay. And then you take it gently using oven mitts. You kind of flip it out of the pan and put it on the oven rack to kind of give the exterior also time to get crunch. Yep. And uh, another 30 minutes at 375. Mm, okay. So this is actually, oh, this, is a, this is a good piece. That looks, wow. I, I mean, yeah. you can tell it's like not all the, sometimes when you bake with fruit, all the stuffs can sink to the bottom, but it's nice and evenly dispersed too. That's amazing. Yeah, and it has good suspension and it has good crumb and like, it's, you know, it's kind of like spongy. So it's like, it's like I said, it's not a very sweet bread, but it does have the texture of like, like an enriched bread and there's no uh you know no butter nothing like that yeah uh, this is really good people ask me so well, how would you eat that and it's like well you eat it by itself right with toasted with butter or jam or almond butter or um but it's really good um to make pudding with it so like if you oh, have like a, a baked bread pudding 
So yeah. if you have any sterile pieces, uh, what I would do, or even make them stale. So like cut them, put them out to air dry, maybe overnight. And then the next day in a casserole dish, make like a custard, like a pudding, like a bread pudding custard. And just let the slices be soaked in the, in the thing, in the custard, and then bake it like you would bread pudding. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it has chocolate and then it has nuts or the dried mm -hmm. chocolate. It's just almost like you don't need anything else. Yeah. Could you substitute other things for the chocolate cranberry combo? Could you do like a dried apricot situation? Like what? Totally. You could do, yeah. there's a recipe in my book that's kind of similar to this, a little bit different, but um, it's with uh, dried apricots and walnuts. Uh, you could use seeds. You could use pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, chia seeds, anything like really you could do, um, even you could do like candied. If you wanted to make this like a Christmas thing or uh, use like candied fruit in it, like or candied orange, candied lemon, uh, candied cherries or things like, you know, and then you make it a little bit more like a fruit bread, but it's a yeasted bread. Mm. Um, yeah, how long should you be, like once it's done, how long should you be waiting before you can slice in it and take a bite? Um, um, in general, for all the breads, um, all the gluten-free breads, you should wait a good hour because what happens is there's a lot of moisture. You, you need more moisture in gluten-free baking. Um, and then, so if you cut into it really fast, what will happen is that there's gonna be a lot of moisture inside of the crumb. And then as you're putting pressure on it, it will, the crumb will wanna like collapse into it or like it'll, be, it'll stick to itself. So then all those nice air bubbles that you have, air pockets, are you, you're kind of squishing them. And it'll, also it'll be gummy. So you wanna let it rest and like all the moisture evaporate. And you can tell when it's done when it's hollow, right? You did the, the tapping. Yeah. yeah, and it should, with that time, it should be ready. And the internal temperature of bread should be 210 degrees Fahrenheit if you are actually taking a thermometer and, and measuring it. So yeah, if you were to use seeds or something in, in, mm -hmm. your, in, your, in the loaf, would you soak them before? Or like, what's a good technique to, to make sure that? You, you could know? soak them. Um, I have a, there's like a rye style Nordic bread in my book. It doesn't use rye, it uses buckwheat, uh, but it has buckwheat groats in it and sunflower seeds and I soak them overnight. Um, but you could also not soak them and, and put them in. For certain, like with the cranberries, um, you know, like a little, they burns a little bit on the exterior. So with dry fruit, like even raisins or especially like something that's a little bit harder like figs, Sometimes you do want to soak them in a little bit of boiling water or like some people do rum or if you want to go like really, really like flavor wise, um, you could soak them and that will also, if they're a little moist, it will prevent them from burning as badly. But it's not, you know, it's also like, do you want to like throw something together fast or do you want, but uh, yeah, with figs, like if I were putting chopped figs in here, I, I would soak them. I, one thing that I, I, I just thought, so I actually have a list of like different treats that I like to make. And I'm thinking of like, what are the best gluten free recipes? Like this is going to be a bit of like a rapid fire, okay. not necessarily rapid, but um, if I were to like make biscuits, like, you know, nice buttermilk biscuits, like what, what's a good flour substitute to use or how do you, how do you make them gluten free? Well, I have a, I have a recipe in my book and I'm not just saying it's so, a, oh, pitch in my book, but there is a recipe. For flaky. That's why we're all here. Flaky biscuits. And it's actually, um, I, I kind of took an adapted uh, Peter Reinhardt's, Peter Reinhardt's biscuits are, and I, I think his are like traditional Southern biscuits, but they're very flaky and he cuts them into squares. And I just remember when I could eat gluten, they were my favorite recipe. So I kind of adapted that and I played with that, with his method of layering. Um, to recreate that. And they have sorghum, brown rice flour, a little bit of potato starch, top of the starch, just sort of like a blend of whole grain and starches. Mm. It, it, it comes from like the Peter Reinhardt method. It's almost like a laminated dough. So it's like you laminate, you have this short dough, right? So it's like frozen butter that's mixed into it and then you laminate it. So that yeah. really is all more layering. That's so, that's so fascinating. Cause yeah, I'm always like, there's no way, but do you have you ever made Peter Reinhardt's biscuits? I have not. I've made um you should. <laughs> McDonald has a really awesome biscuit recipe. And then I've just like whatever's on the New York Times, I think Mark Bittman has something on there too. Okay. Um, what about like banana bread? 
what's a good like gluten-free option for i have banana bread too can, uh, can i bring my book real quick oh my gosh I yeah. you, no, but i should i guess Hold no, on. No. <laughs> i love your studio by the way it's so gorgeous thank you so let's see banana bread yeah this banana bread i have to say it's so it's let me show it down yeah. whoa i love the bananas on top there that's so yeah, cool. I mean, that's not uh, something i've invented but everybody I know. <laughs> special in this moment <laughs> yeah it's timely um but it's gluten it's gluten and dairy free it has almond flour uh, so it's really moist and also when you use oil um i use olive oil but when you use oil in cakes they tend to stay moist for a long time so yeah. it's, like it's really good i feel like that's probably the recipe that people have made the most uh, for my book. And you're using the tall, the tall loaf pan. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. somebody asked that they may have made the banana bread too wet. Is that a thing? How do oh, you- I feel like I've heard that before and that could be, it could happen. And it, maybe if your bananas are really ripe, you know how when bananas are like super ripe, they, or if you've had the bananas in the freezer, they become really wet. And I feel like maybe that was the case if like, you have like really like mushy kind of watery fruit mm. that can, and make sure that you're weighing the ingredients. It's my, you know, like, like, a, you know, like if you go a little bit more on the oil or your eggs, if your eggs are also really big, um, that could, you know, that you're using extra large eggs, um, that makes a difference too. Yeah. So probably just tossing some more flour in there. Again, yeah. trial and error. But it is very liquid. Like when you mix this recipe, it's like it pours like a smoothie. It's it's very liquid. Oh, okay. Nice. Well, it's definitely on my list of, of things to Yeah, try it. Hibernate bake. Um uh another the last one I want to ask and then hopping to another question is with croissants. Oh yeah. Pastries that are gluten free. It seems like I haven't cracked that one. I haven't cracked that one because you're dealing with two things. You're dealing with fermentation and lamination, which are the two things that are super difficult in gluten-free baking. And then you combine them, right? So you're trying to really ferment something and then stretch it. So it's like, you need to really have like a lot of, like, I think like you'd have to use a lot of scent and gum. And, and also like, I, there's a thing for me that I'm not like my, and I'm, I want to, I would love to crack it. And I, if somebody has cracked it, I want to try that recipe, but I'm also not trying to chase like, um, imitations or like, I'm not trying to, I do call like, I will call a recipe brioche because it's sort of like the closest thing to brioche, but it's not like the same thing. And the same with croissants, they have such weight on like people's minds that I feel like, I feel like I don't want to just be an imitator or like second best yeah but, but i would love to because i love croissant. i used to love croissants but well i'm i'm more than happy to, to cross test that recipe uh, yeah it comes up yeah, first, I, I, will, I need to try i need to not give up on that one so one question i want to ask is if you were to have like a gluten-free like there's what are three or four ingredients if you want to start transitioning into gluten-free baking that you should always have in your in your kitchen I think almond flour is a really great uh, thing to add into your flour mixes. So even if you're a person who likes to just buy like an all-purpose gluten-free flour mix because it's easier, you don't have to like you take it from your your cupboard and you you know. But adding something like almond flour will make your baked goods uh, richer, like mm. just like more flavorful, fattier, just like just so much like mouthfeel too, much better. Um, and also I get the question of, um, almond flour. Like if I'm, if you're allergic to nuts and almonds in particular, like what to use and another flour that it's not a nut, but it's called tiger nut flour. It's really good for substitute. I love tiger nuts. Yeah. So good. So delicious. Yeah. Uh, and that is like a great substitute for almond flour for those who can't have uh, nuts. And so that was, let's say almond flour is one. Uh, I love oat flour and I know oat flour is hard. A lot of people who have um, celiac or gluten intolerance also have oat intolerance for some reason because they're the proteins like avenin and gluten are similar structurally and 
bodies react, some bodies react to it also, but I do love oat flour. Um, then psyllium husk powder and flaxseed meal for sure. Um, and also flaxseed is for a lot of people who have egg allergies or are vegan. Let's check before I see Carrie. So that means. Yes, Carrie is going to join. But like if you see the bread has. Oh, that has definitely shown progress. Yeah. So I would say probably another 15 minutes. And is there like a sign that you're just like, I know, again, is there something yeah, that you. Like when you, like, this one is not super bouncy yet. You could feel like it becomes lighter when you touch it. Okay. Um, yeah, and then when it's doubled, for sure. And then what we would do is we would dust the top with some more buckwheat flour and then put it in the oven. Nice. Erin, can I ask a question? I, I seem to remember this from reading the, the recipe. You take it out of the loaf pan at some point, correct? Can you yeah. walk through that? So it would be, so it's, let's say, you need to have oven mitts for, for that. So let's say this is your bread in your oven and then you're with oven mitts and then you kind of like flip it out and upside down and then you put it directly. I'm doing a messy, messy job. But then you put it directly on the oven rack. And what that will do is it will kind of, uh, when you bake it in the pan, sometimes it steams on the sides. So when you take it out, you kind of like have a chance to circ air will circulate around it and it'll kind of bake better. But you could just do it in the pan for an hour and it'd be fine. Mm. Clearly a beautiful crust when you when you uh, cut into it. I think everyone could hear that sort of crackle. Yeah, a little bit. Like it's because it has milk is not super, super crusty. Well, you, if you wanted it to be a little bit crustier, another thing is here, let me cut another piece. So it does make a little bit of sound, but it's not like crumbs falling everywhere. If you did want to make it crustier, you could do half milk, half water. Ooh. That will make it a little bit more crusty. And then if you want to make it even crustier, you could do a steam injection. So like some ovens are, I'm getting too geeky here, but like some ovens have steam injections. Uh, or you could put a cup or a tray, like let's say another tray like this mm -hmm. under your bread with boiling water. When you put your loaf fan in, you pour boiling water underneath it, and that will cause steam, and that will give it even more crust. Like a MacGyver Ben Marie. <laughs> <laughs> That's MacGyver. so fascinating. Um, yeah, I guess I, I I always like asking these questions because you also write in the title of your book that you have basically made something for every meal and every mood, and I feel like moods definitely influence my baking. So I would love to, I just kind of looked through like the book and found two or three moods like what is a good thing that you like to bake when you're feeling warm or yeah or cozy when I'm cozy um I like I'm a soup person I love soup so I'll make lentil soup I mean John's behind the camera and he knows that we eat lentil soup like twice a week <laughs> um uh yeah I would say soup is my go-to and bread but I I make bread all the time uh but it does feel like I, it does, I think making bread just makes everything feel warm and not just like literally because your your house your home is warm but just I don't know there's a feeling to it and there's a you have to tend to bread so there's like an extra component of like caring about something and tending to it, especially with sourdough and understanding it sort of you have a relationship with it yeah for sure mm -hmm. What about if you're feeling like holly and jolly? I feel like we're we're in that season, so <laughs> that might be a little corny, but <laughs> I'm a terrible, terrible celebrator. I need to be a better celebrator of things. I'm just kind of always like, okay, I I did that. I gotta now. I'm thinking about something. I was like, I don't take time to celebrate as much as I should. And this this holiday, I'm like trying to really see. I'm gonna celebrate. So for me, it's more about. The, it's more, more about setting a mood rather than baking or cooking because that's, those are the things that I do all the time for a living. So it's really like lighting candles or um, making sure I use like, like nice napkins because <laughs> I might have like, I know I have all these props and things and sometimes in my life I don't always use them. And so I'm like really trying to be mindful about the environment in which we eat and, and how I spend my time. And I'm not always like, I'm always like rushing in my head and 
So when I want to feel jolly, that I'm going to be mindful of those things of, of making sure that my environment is really reflects that of celebration. I will say in terms of celebrations though, Aaron, you have made it so that so many people in the gluten-free community can celebrate in ways that they couldn't because you've given them literally hundreds of beautiful gluten-free recipes to choose from. So thank you for what you've done for the community. And thank you for answering all Abina's questions and all everyone else's questions. Um, Abina, thank you for hosting again and for walking us through the recipe uh, with Aaron. It was so good to see you. Aaron, one more plug for your book. I know you're shy about plugging your own book, so we're all gonna plug it for you, but um, such a beautiful book, Canel Avani. Um, if you are gluten-free, even if you're not, it's a beautiful cookbook filled with so many gorgeous recipes. Um, can you show us that bread one more time? That bread is just extraordinary. The color. Yes. Give us a taste too. This is a good slice. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I feel like we almost need to have a contest to see who can come up with the most interesting. Yeah. If anybody um, that's watching and wants, to, I love seeing people when they make my recipes and if they have questions, so reach reach out through Instagram and I'm really good at that, like answering. Oh, thank you, Aaron, for that. Um, we want to announce the winner of the Amazon Home gift card, uh, Allison Mazer. Allison, if you're out there, say hi in the chat. Um, you are the winner of the $250 Amazon Home gift card. Congratulations. I saw a lot of things that Aaron was using that I really want. I think I need a tall bread pan in my life. That might be the first thing I go order uh, when we finish. Um, so thank you also to Amazon Home. You're such a wonderful sponsor. Thank you for giving us the gift certificate um, and for all the beautiful things that Aaron was able to use today. Um, Aaron, you look like you want to can say I, something. Can I plug? Not plug. Can I at the plea? people that are watching. Um, I know it's like really hard time for everybody, but uh, there's two, God, I'm getting emotional. There's two organizations I want to support. Um, why am I getting emotional? <laughs> because it's, because uh, it's been a tough 2020, Aaron. That's why. Feeding America and Mary's Place in Seattle. Mm -hmm. If you can donate even $5. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, we would love, like Aaron said, just, you know, either those two charities and we'll share, you know, I see they're already in the chat, um, those two charities or charities of your choice in your neighborhood. You know, a lot of people are in need right now. And if you are in the position where you can help, we absolutely would love if you could. All right. So Aaron, thank you again for helping everyone um, with all your beautiful work. Abina, thank you. Amazon Home, the Cherry Bomb team behind the scenes making this happen. So thank you both. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy holidays, everyone.